In this video, we are going to be going through modular arithmetic. Now, the first video in this series was the set theory video, and it isn't really a prerequisite to this video because we are going to go through things again. However, if you don't know what a set is, I do recommend that you go and watch that video first. Now, with that said, hopefully in this video, you are going to understand by the end what modular arithmetic is, how it works, how to use it, and therefore when you see mod n or percent n, you'll understand what that means and you will understand how integers modulo n really works. And if not, then you'll have some familiarity because the best thing with all these mathematical terms and concepts is to just immerse yourself in the world and see as many articles and resources as you can so that you become super comfortable in the language. It's basically like learning a new language, a math language. Okie dokie artichokey, modular arithmetic. Sounds super fancy, sounds a little bit scary maybe, hence why I've added this cheeky little smiley face because it doesn't need to be scary. It's not anything foreign. You actually use modular arithmetic all the time in your daily life when telling the time. Modular arithmetic is a system of arithmetic for integers where the numbers wrap around upon reaching a certain value, aka the modulus. And if you watched the previous video on set theory, this will be a little bit familiar for you, but I'm going to assume that you haven't watched that video. So let's say we have a number line, zero, one, two, three, four, and upon reaching five, it will wrap back around. So for this example, our modulus n is equal to five. I'll explain that a little more in a second. So as I said, you use modular arithmetic all the time in your daily life when telling the time. So if we have the hours on the clock, 12 up here, we've got six down here, three here, we've got nine here, and then the clock hand will just turn all the way around. And as it reaches 12 again, it will reset and then go back to zero. Here is also zero. We're actually wrapping around each time. And this is an example of modular math. The hours on the clock wrap around upon reaching 12. When we tell the time, we're using this concept of wrapping around a certain value wrapping around 12. You can't have a hundred o'clock. Every time you reach 12, the hour hand wraps around and the time restarts, assuming you're using a 12 hour clock, of course, rather than a 24 hour one. But what is modular math? And what is a modulus? So first let's define what a modulus is. So a modulus is when we take the remainder after division. So if we've got a number A and we do mod, which is usually the percent sign B, or we can say a, and then we do a little mod like that. B, these mean the same thing. What we do is we do a divided by b, and then we take whatever the remainder is. Another way of explaining the remainder, which is a little bit less theoretical and a little bit more practical, is if I use an example. So going back to the old school time sweets in a bag, I have 14 sweets in a bag. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14. I've got 14 sweets in my bag. Now let's say that I have five friends. One, two, three, four, five. And they're all happy because they're getting sweets. Now, if I divide these 14 sweets by my five friends, then I can give five sweets away, one each, and then I can give another five sweets away. And oh no, I don't have five sweets left anymore. I don't have five more sweets to share equally amongst my five friends. I could give one each to four of them and then there will be one person who doesn't have any sweets left. So we're trying to divide 14 sweets by my five friends. So I can say that 14 divided by five equals two. How many times does five go into 14 evenly? That's two. And we've got a remainder, a leftover of four. So we can say that 14 mod five equals to four because 14 divided by five is two with four left over. Let's do a little example. Let's say we've got seven mod five. Five. So seven divided by five is one. And then how many do we have left over? And that's two. So seven mod five is two. Let's do nine mod two. Nine goes into two four times. And then we'd have one left over because four times two is eight. And then one left over gets us to nine. So we've got one. So you know how to do the modulus. And so the set of integers in modular arithmetic, and if you don't understand what a set means, you'll need to go back to the previous video. The set of integers in modular arithmetic is usually denoted by Z, which is the notation for integers, 
and then a slash and then Z N or it's Z subscript N. And this set contains N elements or the cardinality of this set is N. And this N is an integer. So then we can write this set as using the curly brace to denote a set zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. Then we go up to the maximum value in the set is N minus one, because as soon as we reached N, N divided by N goes in into it one time with no remainder. So then we cut back to zero. The term modular refers to the fact that all arithmetic operations, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, are performed with respect to a modulus. After performing such operation, we need to take the result, modulate that number. And this is how we end up looping back to the original value in the set. So for instance, let's say we have addition. So we've got A plus B. And then after we do that, we need to do mod N. Then we have subtraction, which is the same thing, A minus B. And then we do a mod N. Multiplication, same thing, A times B mod N. N is the modulus and it's an integer. We, the result is taken modulo N, meaning that the remainder when the result is divided by N is always going to be a value between zero and N minus one. The wraparound happens naturally due to this modulo operation. So in the context of cryptography and zero knowledge proofs, this modulo N is often chosen to be a prime number. And this is just a little teaser for later. So often you'll see instead of N, you'll see actually this is going to be P. And that is because it's P for prime. And the reason that we're going to be using a prime modulus is going to become clearer shortly. Now, you may notice that we haven't included division. So what about division? Now, actually, we can construct something that does look like division, but division doesn't really exist in modular arithmetic in a usual way. So you couldn't do just A divided by B mod P or N or whatever you want to denote the modulus. However, we can define a division-like operation and we do that using what's called the multiplicative inverse. Now, don't worry too much about this multiplicative inverse and what division looks like in modular math just yet, because this is going to be a little bit clearer once we have talked about some other concepts. But just note in your mind that we can construct something that's division-like, but div division doesn't explicitly exist in modular arithmetic in the usual sense that we're looking, that we're used to. Let's do some examples of addition, subtraction and multiplication just to make sure that we've got this down. Let's say that again, n equals five. Now let's take some random numbers. Let's say we have nine plus two mod five. So nine plus two is 11. 11 goes into five twice with one left over. So that equals to one. What about nine minus two mod five? Nine minus two is seven. Seven mod five is two, because seven goes into five once with two left over. What about nine times two mod five? Nine times two is 18, and 18 goes into five three times with three left over. So that's three. Ah, what a happy coincidence. We've got one, two, and three. And these are elements that are in the set. Zero, one, two, three, four, where the maximum number in the set is going to be n minus one, which is four. And the number of elements in the set or the cardinality is equal to five. So the next thing we want to talk about is congruence. So you can see that when we go back up to this number line, if we had a number, let's say seven, seven can be mapped to number two when we take the modulus. Additionally, number 12 can be mapped also to number two. So we can say that seven, 12, two are all congruent. So we can say two integers, A and B are congruent modulo N if they have the same remainder when divided by N. And this we can write as A is congruent to B mod N. And B are congruent modulo N if the difference between them is a multiple of N. So for instance, 12, minus seven equals five. Therefore two is congruent to seven mod five is congruent to 12 mod five is congruent to 17 mod five and so forth. So if they map to the same value on the number line when doing the modulo n, aka they have the same remainder 
or the difference between the two values is a multiple of n, then those two values are said to be congruent modulo n. And that is a very quick preview of modular arithmetic in order for you to understand some more complex, more interesting examples when understanding the prerequisites for zero knowledge proofs. And so now we can understand things like group theory. So in the next video, we're going to be going through a little bit about group theory in order to understand everything that we need to know to break down zero knowledge proofs and make them a little bit less scary.